This section of the book is on local extrema. Extrema is a weird word. It's uh, short for, or it includes maxima and minima. What the hell does that mean? Maxima and minima mean uh, short <laughs> forms of maximum values and minimum values. Um, it, it's uh, incredibly important where a function attains m its biggest value and its smallest value or um, it's uh, important in lots of applications. You want to maximize profit. You want to minimize the amount of material you use. But we're going to deal with those kind of applications of global maxima and minima, global extrema in the next section. This section is on local extrema, uh, so local maxima and minimum values. It means, okay, you're interested in where a function takes on its biggest value anywhere near here and its smallest value anywhere near this point over here. So it's local in that you care what happens near a point, so in some open neighborhood of the point. Um, that helps us for functions of two variables. That's uh, very helpful for understanding why the graph looks the way it does. And if you don't have any graphing software at your disposal, it would help you draw the graph by hand. Um, hopefully you remember um, discussions of local extrema from single variable calculus. You had a function, you wanted to know where it attained local maxima and minimum, maximum and minimum values. Uh, you found that those had to occur at critical points, places where the derivative was undefined or typically where it was zero. Well, the same thing will happen for multivariable functions. Um, the only place a function can attain local maxima or, or minima is at places where the total derivative is undefined or where the total derivative is the zero function. And as with single variable functions, you had a first and a second derivative test to determine whether a critical point actually gave a local maximum or local minimum value. There are first and second derivative tests for multivariable functions. Um, the first derivative test is complicated, and I will save that for the more depth part of the section. The second derivative test is only easy, relatively easy, for functions of two variables, so that's what we'll concentrate on. But um, let's, let's start with an example. So an example, and I have a particular function that I want to use, um, f, of x, f of xy equals e to the minus x squared, and now I have to look, because this function is rigged to do nice things, e to the minus x squared times 3 minus y to the fourth over 4 plus 5y cubed over 3 minus 3y squared. Let's consider this function. If you have graphing software, <laughs> yeah, in fact, if you have a graph accurately enough, you can kind of tell everything about a function um, accurately enough and in the right window and, all, and you know, with the right scales. It's uh, actually very hard to know when your graph is showing you everything that you, all the interesting features. Uh, that's one of the reasons we do things with calculus instead of just with graphing software. But roughly, the graph of this function looks like Looks like this. Let me put in some level curves, or rough, rough ideas of level curves to make everything look more 3D. All right, roughly the graph looks like this. Um, it's, it looks like from the graph, and it's true, but um, that if you have a global maximum, this the function is obtaining a global maximum value, so the highest point here, um, obtaining global maximum over the origin. So there's a, a, a global maximum here. So the biggest the function ever gets, call that a global maximum value. And that value is, assuming it really occurs at the origin, is f at 0, 0 which if you just plug in 0 and 0, you see that this is 3. Um, and it occurs at xy equals 0, 0, 0. 
right? So a global maximum value means the biggest the function gets anywhere, so globally. Uh, some books refer to this as an absolute maximum value. I will not. Um, there's, there's this point. What's happening at this point? Well, that's the highest point anywhere near there. So we call this, there's a, a local maximum value occurring here. It's not the biggest the function ever gets, but it's the biggest that it gets near here. So a local maximum value. And um, that occurs. So the value itself is f at, it's not, you, know, you would have to actually have the graph drawn by graphing software or do the calculus, which we will do momentarily, but that occurs at, at 0, 3, and that value should be 3 fourths. And then, of course, it occurs at 0, 3. If this graph is representative of what's really going on, there is no global minimum value because the graph just keeps going down arbitrarily far. So there's no global minimum value. Is there a local minimum value? Well, it's a little hard to say. You might suspect, ah, look, that's the smallest the function gets anywhere near there. Um, this kind of valley in between this peak and this peak. Well, it's not really a local minimum value. Yeah, if you stick to this curve that you see, yeah, it's the smallest thing on that curve, but if you took this cross section, you you see some part of the curve that goes down like this, and the function gets smaller in these directions. So that is not a local minimum. We call a point like that where the function gets bigger in some directions and smaller in other directions. We call this a saddle point. And yeah, if you have graphing software, you can see all these things, but one of our questions, or our big question is, without graphing it, how do you find that the function attains these local, uh, this local maximum, this global maximum, which if it's the biggest anywhere, it's also the biggest near here, so it's also a local maximum. How do we find these places where a function attains local and global max, or local maxima and minima, or even can we find saddle points where the function increases in some directions um, and decreases in others. Um, so that's what we're after. We need, we need some rigorous definitions before we do that. Um, it may be clear, and then, but I should go ahead and define what a local maximum minimum mean, which requires me to define what a global maximum minimum means. So the definition, don't let, <coughs> this is just supposed to be a rigorous definition of what you should already know but there are a couple of points to make about it. Um, suppose you have so we have a function f um, uh, have a real value. Suppose you have a real value function F, whose domain is is a subset of Rn. All right, so we've got some function defined on some subset of Rn, some real valued function defined on a subset of Rn. Then what does it mean um, for F to have a global maximum value at a point? Then F attains a global. Yeah, let me let me say let let's fix a point P. Let P be in the domain. Let P be in E. So then F attains a global maximum value of f of p at the point p, if and only if well, 
If and only if f of p is the biggest thing, is, is the biggest value that f ever takes on. Now biggest, it's unclear whether other things are allowed to equal it, but we'll make that definition, we'll allow equals to, but then use the word strict later to mean where it's bigger, actually bigger than everything else. If and only if, for all x and e, f of p is greater than or equal to f of x. Great. It just says a global maximum is, is a place where, uh, occurs at a place where the value of the function is greater than or equal to the value of the function anywhere else that the function is defined. That's all that says. No, so we do allow equals to. So for instance, if f were the constant function, which sounds stupid, but if f were constantly 17 um, and defined on all of our n, if f were constantly 17, then we would say that f attains its global maximum value of 17 everywhere. At every point it attains its global maximum value of 17. Um, but we're not really <laughs> interested in the constant function. So um, this is what it means for f to attain a global maximum, uh, a global minimum. Well, I hope you could figure out how to change this. A global minimum value of f of p, if and only if for all x, f of p is less than or equal to everything else. So it's the smallest the function ever gets, but other points are allowed to be as small because we include the equals. So that's a global minimum value. Um, instead of saying global maximum values, we say global maxima. Instead of saying global minimum values, we sometimes say global minima. And to lump both maxima and minima together, we, sometimes, we frequently say extrema. So you know, what I've just defined are global extrema, what it means for f to attain global extrema. Um, if we wanted to not have the equal sign there, we throw in the word strict. So you could say a strict global minimum value of f of p, if and only if, and then you would have this. This is called a strict inequality. That's why we say strict global minimum. And uh, of course, a strict global maximum would mean this. We won't use this, the notion of strict very often. Um, we're happy with less than or equal to or greater than or equal to. Um, so that's, if, if I ever throw in strict, it just means you're not allowing equals to. Um, so then what's a local maximum? And uh, so this is our definition of f obtaining a global maximum at a point. What's a lo what does it mean for f to attain a local maximum at a point? It means that, well, it's the global maximum in some, you think, small open neighborhood around the point, but you don't have to say small, in some open neighborhood. So f attains a local maximum value of f of p at p, if and only if there is an open neighborhood uh, u of p in Rn. So you can think an open ball such that um, F attains a global, uh, pff, not F, F restricted to E intersected with you attains a global maximum value of p. All right. What does it say? It says what I said it should say, that 
what does it mean to have a local maximum? It means if you restrict f to a smaller domain, so a domain where it's not just E but E intersected, so that means you only look at points in E that are in this small ball, uh, small open set around P, or this open set around P, some open set around P, then F has, um, a, attains a global maximum value at P. That F restricted to that set. So it means that you only look at X's in here now, so that F of P is greater than or equal to F of X for all X's in this open set around P. So it's a global maximum of the function restricted to a small open set. Um, that means it's a local maximum. It's the, the biggest F ever gets in some open set around P. And similarly, you just put for a local minimum value, it attains a global minimum value. All right. You shouldn't worry too much about the technical definitions. That's just what you have to say to uh, encode correctly what near means. The, uh, the, what I wanted to emphasize what is what strict means, that um, restricting your domain is important, and that we allow, yeah, that normally with local maximum and minima, we allow equals, we allow nearby points to have the same value. Um, this bit about restricting the domain is, um, important even for functions of one variable, so let me warn you of something that will be very important to us, certainly in the next section. Suppose I take, even for a function of one variable, suppose I take y equals f of x equals x. What does this have attain any local maxima or minima, any local extreme values? No. It gets it just keeps getting bigger in that direction and smaller in that direction. There are no local extreme values of this function if you mean it's defined on all of R. But suppose I say um, restrict F to the domain The, open, uh, the half open interval from zero to infinity, so just the non-negative real numbers. Well, that chops off the graph right there. Technically, this is a, a new function. A function includes the domain, and this is a new function because we changed its domain from all the reals to this interval. Now, this function does, in fact, have uh, a local and, in fact, a global minimum occurring where x is zero. So, it's important to know that the, my point here is just that it's really important to know the domain of the function you're talking about. When we restrict the domain, we can kind of artificially, that restriction creates local maxima and minima because we only look at points in the domain of the function and you only have to be the biggest or smallest of all the points in the domain. All right, um, enough of that. Let's look at another graph of a more interesting function than the graph of a line, a graph that's a line. Um, let's look at an example that we looked at in an earlier section where we looked at tangent planes. So we had an example of f of xy equals 5x over x squared plus y squared plus 1. And roughly, the graph looked like, and my ability to, to draw this is limited, roughly, we had a graph that looked like Um, that looked like this. Um, 
we were looking at this, so it has a peak here and a, I guess I'll call this a pit, a pit here. And what we were interested in that problem was where the graph had horizontal tangent planes. And we found, in fact, there was a horizontal tangent plane right here and a horizontal tangent plane right here. So the horizontal tangent planes were where the gradient of f was the zero vector. Um, and we found those points to be that was minus one, zero, minus five halves. So, well, actually, minus one, zero, minus five halves. And one, zero, five halves. And yeah, we, we noticed at the time that they that those tangent planes were horizontal at the same places where the function obtained its local maximum, so this peak and at this pit. Is that true in general? And the answer is yes. Well, it's true that the only places that local maximum, local minimum could occur must have horizontal tangent planes. It's not true that every place that the tangent plane is horizontal, you have to have local maximum minimum. Um, so that's, I need to make a definition, and then I'll state the theorem that's analogous to the single variable theorem. It's not hard to prove. You can basically just use the single variable theorem to prove it. So definition, I will continue with my function f that has domain E, which is some subset of Rn, and it gives me back real values. So then a point P in E is a critical point of F if and only if either, just like in single variable calculus, it's if the function is not differentiable or if the derivative is zero. In the case we care about the most is derivative zero because we typically deal with differentiable functions. Same thing here, except differentiable means the total derivative exists. So if and only if either f is not differentiable at P, or, or the derivative, meaning the total derivative, is the zero function. Or what's the same thing? The gradient vector is the zero vector. So, or, or the gradient vector of F at P is the zero vector. So I'll put in parentheses, i.e. dpf is the zero function, the function that's always zero. So that's the definition of a critical point. And the theorem, which should sound just like calculus one, I mean, one single variable calculus theorem, If f attains a local extreme value, so a local maximum or a local minimum, a local extreme value at p, then p is a critical point. And this isn't difficult if you know the, the one variable theorem, because what you can say, oh, well, you know, 
suppose f attains a local extreme value at p. If f is not differentiable at p, then uh, yes, of course, p is a critical point. If f is differentiable at p, we'd like to see that the gradient vector has to be zero. So what, to prove this, you need to know if f attains a local extreme value at p, and it's differentiable at p, then the gradient vector must be zero. That's what we would need to show, but you can just look at the x and y cross sections. If you fix the y coordinate, then if, you're if f attains a local extreme value at p, then when you fix the y coordinate and take a y cross section, of course, in that cross section, um, I'm now thinking of a function of two variables, but it's true for any number of variables. Um, let's just deal with two. If you fix a y cross section, then you get a function of one variable, just the x, just the x variable, and that function has to obtain an extreme value at the point, that function of one variable. That means its derivative has to be zero. It either means it doesn't exist, but that's not true. We're assuming f, the function of two variables, is differentiable. So certainly the, the derivative when you restrict to a cross-section exists, because that's the partial derivative. Um, the partial derivative has to exist, and it has to be zero from one variable calculus. The same thing for when you restrict to the x cross-section passing through the point. Um, if you restrict to the x cross-section, the function, the restricted function has to attain a local extreme value. That means the function has to be not differentiable or the derivative has to be zero, but the function is differentiable because its derivative is the partial derivative of f. So you get this theorem fairly quickly from the one variable theorem. And and it's important not to read too much into it. It says if, you, if f obtains a local extreme value, then p is a critical point. It does not say if p is a critical point, then f attains a local extreme value. That's just false. But what it does say is the only places you have to look for local extreme values is at critical points. So you find the critical points of f and then you need some way of deciding whether you actually have local maxima or minima there. So, um, let's look at, let's return to our, the example I started with. Um, before I return to that, I should, since this is sitting here on the board, yeah, so, the horizontal tangent planes here occur where the gradient is zero. Those are critical points. Those, are, um, right? Those occur at critical points because the horizontal tangent planes occur where the gradient vector is zero. So these two points where the tangent plane were horizontal are the only places the function could attain local maximum or minimum values. That doesn't prove that they do. The graph is very convincing but they're the only places where it could. All right, well, let's look at the example we started with. So even though it looks complicated, it's not terribly. Let's look at f of xy equals e to the minus x squared times three minus y to the fourth over four plus 5y cubed over 3 minus 3y squared. All right. I remind you that my rough sketch of the graph look like look like this. And we, if we really have local maxima and minima, minimum values occurring at these points, which we believe we do, we ought to be able to find them by finding critical points. So we ought to find critical points that correspond to those. Um, this one will occur, where I said it would occur, at 0, 0, and this one should occur at 0, 3. It's, it may be unclear what happens at this valley right here, but we'll see. 
All right. So let's find the critical points of this function. Well, certainly, it's a, certainly the function is differentiable everywhere. So the critical points are just where the gradient vector is 0. So we'll take both partial derivatives, set them both equal to 0, and solve simultaneously. This is not very bad. The partial derivative of f with respect to x is minus 2x e to the minus x squared. And then all the y stuff just stays the way it was. 3 minus y to the fourth over 4 plus 5y cubed over 3 minus 3y squared. The partial derivative with respect to y e to the minus x squared just sits there, but now you get minus y cubed um, plus 5y squared minus 6y. If I factor out a minus y, I'll factor out a minus and then a y, you're left with that, I factored out a minus y, so you get a y squared minus 5y plus 6. Ah, but this factors, and that's <laughs> how this example was rigged, so that this factors, times y minus 2 times y minus 3. And to find the critical points, what we want to do is see where the gradient vector is 0. So that's where all the partial derivatives are 0. We need to set that equal to 0 and set this equal to 0 and solve simultaneously. Well, e to the something is never 0. So this equality tells us that y is 0 or y is 2 or y is 3. You can check that if you put in y is 0, 2, and 3, none of those make this 0. So for this to be 0, same time, you would need to have, this can't be 0, so you'd need to have x is 0. So if you put those in up there, you get that x has to be 0. And so we get three critical points. Um, x, y, so our critical points. x, y is, um, x is 0, y is 0, so we get 0, 0, or x is 0, y is 2 or x is 0, y is 3. And you can, so those are the critical points. Not surprisingly, this one is, this one is 0, 0, f at 0, 0, which is 3, but um, this one is 0, 3. So that point on the graph, the critical point is an x, y pair, but then there's the corresponding point on the graph, which would include the value of f at 0, 3, which uh, should be 3 fourths. I did it correctly before. Um, and this, the third critical point we're finding is right here at 0, 2, f of 2, f of 0, 2. Notice that, yeah, this critical point really gave us a local maximum value. In fact, it's global, but this calculation doesn't tell us that. Um, this critical point gave us a local maximum value. This critical point, I'll say it again, it's a critical point. The tangent plane is horizontal, but the tangent plane will cut through the graph because in, the, in this direction, the function increases, and in this direction, the function decreases. So um, what would we like to know? Well, we know that critical points give us the only places where the function could attain local extreme values, local extrema, but, but how do you decide whether you actually have a local maximum or a local minimum or a saddle point, a, a point where the function decreases in some directions and increases in the others? I mean, I, when I say how do you decide, I mean without a graph. Maybe we've got a function of, of more variables. Um, that case is more complicated, so we are going to stick with functions of two variables. But maybe we don't have graphing software. Maybe we don't know where to look on the graph. Maybe we don't know what window to check. Maybe we can't even tell what we're seeing when we look at the graph. The question is, how can we use calculus to tell what's happening at the various critical points? 
And that's where we use the second derivative test. It's, um, you should remember the second derivative test from Calc 1. Let me quickly. What happened in Calculus 1, so in single variable calculus, is that if a function attains a local minimum value at a critical point, you expect the graph to look roughly like this near the critical point. Here's the critical point, place where the tangent plane is horizontal. And if it attains a local minimum value, you expect it to curve upward away from that. So to be concave up. So what you found is that if you were at a point x, well, actually let me call it p, and you had f of p is 0, and f double prime of p to curve upward, um, that means the second derivative, we hope it would be positive. So if the first derivative is 0 and the second derivative is positive, then there's a local, you have a local minimum value. And on the other hand, at a local maximum, you expect f prime to be 0, but f double prime, you would like concave down. So f double prime at p being negative would give you concave down, and then this would give you. All right, this is what the second derivative test looked like for single variable calculus. Of course, there are more second derivatives for a function of two variables. You can take the second derivative with respect to x, the second derivative with respect to y, and the mixed partial derivative, once with respect to x and once with respect to y, which will be the same as doing the partial with respect to y and then x if, if the partial derivatives are continuous. So, and the second derivative test refers to all those derivatives. It is more complicated. We will not derive it. But, what does it say? So this is the second derivative test. Um, if you want, this is for local extrema. And it says, suppose that a function of two variables, there is a generalization of this to any number of variables, but it gets a lot harder, so we're going to stick with two. Suppose that f of xy has continuous second partial derivatives. So it also has, that means it also has to have continuous first partial derivatives, which um, in particular means it's differentiable. Suppose that it has continuous second partial derivatives. So that means all of them twice with respect to x, twice with respect to y, and once with respect to x and once with respect to y. And this also implies that if you take the partial of f with respect to x and then y, it's the same as taking the partial with respect to y and then x. As continuous second partial derivatives near p and that the gradient of f at p is zero. So p is a critical point. So we're at a critical point um, where the function does have first and second derivatives. We'd like a second derivative test. What does it say? We need something that kind of controls the second derivatives in all possible cross sections, not just x and y, but combinations of the x and y. And it's, uh, it gets a little messy, but we uh, let d equal the determinant, so remember what the determinant, uh, I'll remind you, the determinant of a two by two matrix is. So the determinant of, all right, you take the second partial derivative of f with respect to x, evaluate it at p, 
um, you take the mixed partial derivative and put it here and here, and you take the partial second partials with respect to y be here. So that determinant, called the determinant of a two by two matrix, means this times this minus this times this. So this is fxx times fyy minus fxy squared evaluated, all evaluated at p. So we let d be that and assume d is not zero. If d is zero, the test tells you nothing. The same, it's uh, like in the second derivative test for functions of a single variable. If the second derivative is zero, the test doesn't apply. Assume d is unequal to zero. Then, then we can decide what happens. Then, there are three cases. Then, one, if D is positive and fxx at P is greater than zero. So, you should think of this as the, the second derivative zero, uh, greater than zero. You should think the concave up case, so local minimum. Then, f attains a local minimum value. At P. Two. If D is greater than zero and FXX. By the way, you could put FYY at P here. It doesn't matter which one you check. If D is greater than zero, then this is positive, if and only if FYY is positive, and the same thing would apply here. You could always use FYY. I'm just picking on negative. Then you should think second derivative negative, concave down. Then F attains a local maximum value at P. And three, if D is less than zero, you should think, oh, the function, it's like something's, some deri second derivative is positive, some second derivative is negative, um, and their product, you should think of D as kind of the product that it's coming out negative, that's why it's happening. And um, that should mean the function go increases in some directions and decreases in others. Yes, if d is less than zero, then the graph of f has a saddle point. at well, p, f of p. All right, so those are the three cases. Um, you probably think I'm about to do this for the example that I had up here last, the e to the minus x squared times the quantity 3 minus y to the fourth plus 5y cubed over 3 minus 3y squared. That example is fairly complicated, and I will return to that in the, uh, the more depth part of the section. But I'd like to finish just by doing a couple of easier examples. Still not easy, but some easier examples of applying the second derivative test. Um, maybe before I do that, I will comment. This matrix has a name. This is called the, the Hessian matrix of F. It's a matrix of second partial derivatives. Uh, sometimes it's written as Hess F. 
you have to be a little careful. Some people also refer to the determinant of the Hessian matrix as just the Hessian. So, um, and this, the determinant of the Hessian matrix being unequal to zero, this, we say the critical point P is non-degenerate. So the, this just gives us some terminology for which critical points, which type of critical points the second derivative test applies to. It applies to non-degenerate critical points. So the second derivative test applies when P is, well, the, the function has to be differentiable enough, so have continuous second partial derivatives. The gradient vector has to be zero, so it has to be a critical point where the gradient vector is zero, and then the determinant of this matrix of second partial derivatives, the determinant of the Hessian matrix, has to not be zero at the point P. If those things are true, we say that the critical point P is non-degenerate, and the, the second derivative test tells us how to classify non-degenerate critical points. It tells us when they yield local maxima, local minima, or saddle points, which are neither local maxima nor local minima. All right. Let's look at an easier example. So typical instructions might be something like Uh, let's let f of x, y be 3x minus x cubed minus 2y squared plus y to the fourth. Find all the critical points of f. Verify that they're all non-degenerate. So so that the determinant of the Hessian matrix is not zero at any of them. Verify that they're all non-degenerate and classify. The critical points. Classify, by that I mean determine whether they correspond to local maxima, local minima, or saddle points. And classify the critical points. All right. Well, you do what you do. So there's a function of x and y. It's a polynomial. It's certainly infinitely differentiable, continuously differentiable, so that certainly it's second, it has second continuous second partial derivatives. So um, we need to calculate the partial derivatives, set them both equal to zero, and solve simultaneously to find the critical points. Then we need to look at the Hessian matrix and verify that its determinant's never zero, and then we need to check the second derivative test. So the partial derivative with respect to x is 3 minus 3x squared. The partial derivative of f with respect to y is minus 4y plus 4y cubed. Um, so this is 3 times 1 minus x squared. This is 4 times y times minus 1 plus 4y uh, plus y squared. We want to set these equal to 0 and solve simultaneously. Uh, we need 1 minus x squared to be 0. That means x squared is 1. So this is x is plus or minus 1. In this one, you need y, you need this to be 0. So y is 0 or y squared is 1. So y is plus or minus 1. So we get y is 0 or plus or minus 1. 
So we get six critical points, which is kind of annoying, but nonetheless, that's what you get. You get critical points, and the xy pairs x is 1, y is 0, x is 1, y is minus 1, x is 1, y is 1. And then there's all the ones where x is minus 1. x is minus 1, y is 0, x is minus 1, y is minus 1, and x is minus 1, and y is 1. All right, so we get six critical points. Well, that's kind of annoying. <laughs> we need to verify that they're all non-degenerate and classify them according to the second, use the second derivative test to classify them. All right, I wish I had the space to leave the second derivative test up, but I don't. So, all right, we need the Hessian matrix, which means we need the second partial derivatives. So, fxx, so the second partial with respect to x is minus 6x. fxy is 0. And fyy, take the partial derivative with respect to y, or the partial derivative with respect to y, is minus 4 plus 12y squared. All right. So, what do we get for the Hessian matrix? We get 0, ah, well, all right. What do we get for the Hessian matrix without any of our points plugged in? And you do want to do this first. You get minus 6x, and then here you get minus 4 plus 12y squared. And here you get 0 and 0. So the determinant is this times this minus this times this. So the d that we're after is minus 6x times minus 4 plus 12y squared. But this is d with x and y. And we need to evaluate this at each of the critical points. So we have six different critical points that we have to put in here and verify that at all of them, d is not 0. Well, we'll do that at the same time that we check all the other assumptions, of, or check all the other conditions, assumptions of the, of the second derivative test. There's no way around this. You just have to do six cases separately. So we've got d is minus 6x times minus 4 plus 12y squared. And we've got six critical points, so you just start. You've got, so at one zero. So I start with our first critical point. You put in x, x is one and y is zero, and you will get d is minus six times one times minus four. Minus minus, this is plus. So this is greater than 0. And I'll remind you that fxx, we need, we'll need this, is minus 6x. So that here, fxx is, we're putting in x is 1, so is minus 6. This is less than 0. So d being greater than 0 means we either have a local maximum or a local minimum. How do you tell? You check fxx, it's negative, you see negative, concave down. That means you have a local maximum occurring here. Okay, <laughs> then what do you do? You move on to the next point. At the next critical point, at 1 minus 1. Well, what's d? d here. I mean, these are in terms of x and y, so you just plug in x is 1, and y is minus 1, so we'll get minus 4 plus 12. So you get 8, so this, is, so this is negative. Oh, there's no need to check fxx. If d comes out negative, you have a saddle point. Oh, 
Okay. Uh huh. What happens at, let's check, at 1, 1? D is negative 6 times 1 times minus 4 plus 12 again. Again, it's negative because this is 8 times minus 6. Again, you have a saddle point. And you just keep going. You just have to check all six of these. Um, let me check one more, and then I'll stop with this example and then do another one. But let's look at minus 1, 0. So at minus 1, 0. All right. At minus 1, 0, you get d is, all right, x, you get minus 6 times minus 1, and y is now 0 times minus 4. We get minus, 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 negative. Again, you get a saddle point. Um, you might wonder if you get saddle points for all of these now. Um, no, I said I was only going to do one more, but I can't stop. Let's do minus 1, 1. At minus 1, 1, you get d is, all right, you get minus 6 times minus 1. And then you put in y is 1, and you get, and you get um, 8. So you get minus 4 plus 12, you get 8. Negative times negative, this is positive. So we either have a local maximum or local minimum. fxx here is minus 6x, but we're putting in x as minus 1, so it's minus 6 times minus 1. It's greater than 0. You should think concave up. Right? The second derivative is positive. You should think concave up. You have a local min occurring here. All right. That's how you use the second derivative test and classify it. Um, in a sense, this example is too, I mean, it has six critical points, so it's not easy. On the other hand, the mixed partial derivatives with respect to x and y were zero, so somehow it looks easier than some cases. So let's do an example where the mixed partials don't come out to be zero, um, and then we'll stop. So. Same instructions, we want to find and classify all the critical points. I mean, along the way, you'll verify that the critical points are non-degenerate. So another example, let's look at um, f of xy equals 4xy minus x to the fourth minus y to the fourth. All right. We want to find all the critical points, and we want it to decide. We want to apply the second derivative test and decide whether we have local maxima, minima, or saddle points. If we found a, a degenerate critical point, we just wouldn't know. If we found a place where the determinant of the Hessian matrix is zero, we wouldn't have a test yet that would help us with that. But that's not going to happen. So let's. Um, this function is polynomial. It's infinitely continuously differentiable. The uh, partial with respect to x, 4y minus 4x cubed. The partial with respect to y, uh, I, I think I said 4x, 4y minus 4x cubed. The partial with respect to y, 4x minus 4y cubed. Um, these aren't so trivial to solve simultaneously, but they're not bad. Um, they look pretty bad, but they're really not. So we need to solve simultaneously y, y minus x cubed equals 0 and x minus y cubed equals 0. All right. This says y equals x cubed. If you plug that in right there, you get x minus x cubed cubed. It's x to the ninth. So x to the ninth equals 0. You can factor out an x. That's x times 1 minus x to the eighth equals 0. So either x is 0 
or x to the eighth is one, that means x is plus or minus one. So we get x is zero or plus or minus one. And you might think, okay, and you get y is zero plus or minus one, and then there are nine ways of putting those together. That's not true, and you have to be careful. It's just, it is true that if you had solved for y instead, you get y equals zero or plus or minus one. It's true those are the only choices for y, but you can't just pair them arbitrarily with these. That your y values are completely restricted by your x values. y is always x cubed for every pair that we're looking for. So our xy pairs, yeah, we can have x is 0, x is 1, or x is minus 1, but the y value is always the x value cubed. Well, the cube of 0 is 0, and the cube of 1 is 1, and the cube of minus 1 is 1. So really, there are only three critical points. It's not that you can mix and match the 0 plus or minus 1 for the x's with the 0 and plus or minus 1 for the y's. This is extremely important. There are only three critical points here, not nine. Um, so these are the critical points. So these are the critical points. And now we want to look at the second derivative test. So um, All right, we've, we've got fx is 4y minus 4x cubed, fy is 4x minus 4y cubed. We found our critical points, the critical points are 0, 0, 1, 1, and one minus, uh, minus one minus one. So those are the critical points. Um, we need the, the matrix of second partials. We need the Hessian matrix. So let's just calculate. fxx is minus 12x squared. fxy, we can either take the partial derivative of this with respect to y or the partial derivative of this with respect to x. Either way, you get the constant 4. Um, and then fyy is minus 12y squared. So your Hessian matrix is minus 12x squared, 4, 4, minus 12y squared. And its determinant is times this, so we get 144 x squared, y squared, minus 16, minus this times this. So minus 16. And we have to evaluate this. So this is our d. And we have to evaluate this and look at fxx at these critical points. So let's see if we can fit it right here. At 0, 0, what happens? We get d is negative 16. Oh, there's a saddle point. Well, that was easy. How about at 1, 1? When x is 1 and y is 1, you get 144 minus 16. We don't really care what that is, except that it's positive. d is greater than 0. Well, what's fxx? It's minus 12x squared. It's always, it's, you know, x is squared, so it, as long as x isn't 0, which, um, we get negative 12, which is negative. Neg OK, so a negative xxx, you should think concave down, which means you have a local max occurring here. As soon as we got d was positive, you had to have a local maximum or a local minimum. And it just depends on whether fxx is positive or negative. And finally, at minus 1, minus 1, Again, you get d is 144 minus 16. d is still positive. And fxx doesn't change because it's minus 12x squared. So yeah, x is now negative 1, but it's squared. So fxx is still negative 12, which is less than 0. Uh, so 
So you get a local max. Again. All right. Well, that's how you use the second derivative test to find local maximum, maxima and minima. And, you know, we talked about critical points. Those are the only places that local maxima and minima can occur for functions of any number of variables. The local maxima and minima can only occur at critical points. Second derivative test, as we've stated, is only for two variables. You need to remember this stuff. Um, you don't need the second derivative test in the next section, but you do need the fact that local maxima and minima can only occur at critical points because in the next section we want to look at global maxima and minima in applications. And the reason you don't care about the second derivative test is you don't care. We're trying to find global maxima and minima, and the second derivative test doesn't tell you that. So in that respect, it's kind of useless. The only thing knowing that the only good it would do you to know something's a local maximum is that, well, the function couldn't attain its minimum value at a local maximum. That's about it. But you wouldn't know whether it was a global maximum or not. So we have to do something else. Um, but we'll, we'll look at that in the next section.